This is the first competitive football match between two countries who were once deadly enemies. Serbia and Bosnia-Herzegovina. One has been ostracised from the international community for trying to make all of the former Yugoslavia its own. The other is taking its first few steps after independence and a long and brutal civil war that turned neighbours into enemies. They're fighting for a place in the 2006 World Cup Finals, but in this match, there's much more at stake. Sarajevo, capital of Bosnia-Herzegovina. It's calm now, but less than 10 years ago, this was the focal point for what's been described as genocide. Today, these international peacekeepers, some from Britain, are planning security for the big match ahead, the World Cup qualifier between Serbia and Bosnia. But Henri, these, um, these bridges, will they be up during the game? Uh, they will fix some uh, fences. The security forces are taking no chances. The war may be over, but everywhere here you can see signs that it's far from forgotten. So, so this is where the Serbian fans will be? Yes, it's supposed to be that place uh, from the corner till here, approximately. So this whole area will be closed off? Yes, uh, it will be closed uh, by fences on each side and the local police will uh, avoid any kind of intrusion inside. So this is the part of the stadium where the Serbian fans will be sitting, just over this barrier. And the graffiti on the wall outside says Srav Serbe na verbe, which basically means all Serbs should be hung from trees. A hasty paint job is about to take place. They're taking away all of the, uh, yeah, the banners like and the, the nationalist flags, and yet it's all written all over where the away supporters are going to be entering the ground. And what about songs? Are they, are they banned from singing certain songs? Because we've heard songs about Karadic and Mladic and... Don't know. But how do you police that? Yeah. As part of the former Yugoslavia, Sarajevo had been celebrated as an ethnically tolerant city made up of Croats, Serbs and the majority Bosnian Muslims. But in the early 1990s, the republics of Croatia first, then Bosnia, declared their independence from the capital in Belgrade, and everything changed. It triggered an orgy of violence throughout former Yugoslavia. Sarajevo was surrounded by Bosnian Serb forces. And the city became a slaughterhouse. This is Sarajevo in a valley, and this is old Sarajevo, which is four or five hundred years old, built under the Ottoman Empire. And because most of the villages surrounding Sarajevo were populated by Serbs, the Serb military could move in and occupy those villages very easily, surround the city and just shell it from all sides, from all of the surrounding hills. And um, once they had surrounded it, that siege lasted four years. Sarajevo is still badly damaged, and you see hideous scars on civilian targets everywhere. A football match between these two warring nations seems like an insanely naive idea. This is Zelnitscher FC, known locally as JLO, one of Bosnia's top football clubs. Alan Ramic, a 24-year-old Bosnian Muslim and passionate JLO fan, was a schoolboy when the war broke out. During the war, the stadium was right on the front line, separating Bosnian and Serb forces. Bosnian Serb tanks were actually parked on the pitch here. 
How badly damaged was it during the war? It was a disaster. The lights, the pitch, the terraces, everything was gone. You can see sh shrapnel holes, bullet holes. The big hole is anti-aircraft gun hole. Yeah. It was something like our Wembley. We have destroyed your Wembley. Yeah. That was our Wembley. The club meant so much to Alan that as a boy, he risked his life just to take a look at his beloved stadium. I was 12 years old and my father said, don't go in the stadium and I have to go. And I go in the trenches near Bosnian soldiers and they, everybody were, were saying, where are you going? Uh, and I said, I, I'm going to see my stadium. And my heart was big like, like a mountain and I cannot explain that. Look at me. Around my neck, I have the sign of my religion and I have Sheila here. Usually people wear something else, name of their girl or something. First God, Sheila, then everything else. Simply as that. In 1996, the Serbs realized they couldn't take Sarajevo and ended the siege. They retreated, but as they did so, they laid mines. The mines are slowly being cleared, but thousands of minefields still exist throughout Bosnia. We had mines, I don't know, at least four years after the war. And this time was all that separated the fans from the minefield here? And it's no longer a minefield? Let's see. <laughs> You've been here before? <laughs> Once, uh, <laughs> nature calls. <laughs> If we want to try, let's see trenchers. This is one of the mined areas that's been cleared. And the, these were Serbian trenches before they took the football ground? Yes. This is what they, they attacked the football ground from here? Yes, yes. And it's really, really a miracle how, how we <laughs> stay alive. Truly, it's a miracle. Mm. You don't have to travel far to see that many Bosnians weren't so lucky. This is why there is so much bitterness towards the Serbs. No one knows exactly how many Bosnians were killed during the war, but it's generally agreed that the death toll was at least 150,000 and could be as high as a quarter of a million. That's the Kosovo Stadium, where the match is a week Saturday. Um, it used to be surrounded by four training pitches, but now there are just two, because during the war, people couldn't leave the city because Sarajevo was a city under siege. And so the only place they could bury their dead, the only place where there was a flat piece of free ground, were two of the four training pitches. And so now the stadium is almost surrounded on two sides by a huge cemetery and most of the dates on the cemetery say that the people here died between 1992 and 94 and 95, the years of the Bosnian War. Alan and his family live right above the road that became known as Sniper's Alley. For four years here, they were virtual prisoners in their own home. Standing here in, in 1992 or 1993, four and five, was a complete menace. We'll be dead in a couple of minutes. So the sniper fire would come from, from all angles, from here, from here, from sniper here. Sniper fire from this building, from surrounding buildings, from hills. The only safe place in, in, in the town was the basement or atomic shelter or something like that. This is you? Yes. <laughs> Alan led me to his bedroom. It was a shrine to his club, JLO FC. And the bed is blue. What can I see? My heart is blue. And the curtains are blue. Yes, and the flag is blue. And the walls are blue. Everything is blue. And the helmets? And of course, some war souvenirs. It's a Bosnian helmet. This is a 600 years old symbol of Bosnia with lilies. Lilies are a uh, symbol of Bosnian kings. 
And this is a Serbian helmet. But they're the same. Yeah, they belong to Yugoslav National Army, and they had a red star here. So these are both helmets from soldiers who are now dead? Yes. You have to fight like a Bosnian. You have to play like a Bosnian in 110% of your heart. That's the most important thing. But does that mean if you, if you beat Serbia on Saturday, that will be a, a big, believe a big me, step? Believe me, half of country will be happy, half of country will be sad. And that's really sad. Alan's father, like all men old enough to fight, did what he could to defend the city against the attacking Serbs. Although, as you hear all the time in Sarajevo, the two sides are not so clearly defined. Alan's mother is half Serbian. On the 28th of August 1992, uh, yes. he was captured by a special military unit from Yugoslav National Army. They were the only guys who, who, who had courage uh, to, to come closer. Alan's father was taken to a makeshift prisoner of war camp and tortured. Some kind of Serbian SAS squad, something like that. And, and did you expect to be executed? Yes. Yes, he, he was expecting that. No, for me, yes. He was, um, how should I say? Ready to die. Ready to die. Already badly hurt. He was made to stand in the same position for days on end. So you couldn't move even your fingers, and you cannot move because you were beaten. And, so, and soldiers would be watching them? Yes, all the time, war. all the time. The soldiers had shift and they were, they were watching. Um, and he was already beaten, so, so, so he was pissing blood. And, and, and the, the, the his ribs were broken. So, so how do you feel about the fact that the Serbian national team is coming here. I know you take us a shake, put it to two cups, the other, a little two. Yeah, son, I told Scobo, what you look at a scotch. This is Belgrade, the capital of Serbia, the city Alan's dad wants to drop a nuclear bomb on. I travelled here in winter after I heard that football in Serbia was intrinsically linked to the war. I'd heard stories that some of the atrocities committed in Bosnia had been carried out by hooligans recruited from the football terraces of Belgrade. And they came mainly from one club, Red Star Belgrade, the biggest club in the country. Here at the 60th anniversary of the club, former players from six decades are remembering the glory days. Fifteen years ago, in 1991, and just 12 months before the war broke out, Red Star Belgrade reached the European Cup final in Italy. He scores! They beat Olympic Marseille to win the Cup for the very first time. The European Cup also gave the world its first glimpse of the Red Star fans in action. Their home is the north bank of Red Star Stadium. On these terraces, they stage some of the most dramatic displays of football support seen anywhere in the world. Tickets for this match were sold out in five hours and they could have filled this stadium three times over. No Yugoslavian side has ever won the Champions Cup but you won't convince anyone of this crowd in Belgrade tonight that Red Star are not on their way to the final this year and that they'll be successful. The atmosphere is fantastic. For 
15 years, Zoran Avramovic has been the chief executive of the club. Through war and peace, he's seen things most football managers can scarcely imagine. And he knows all too well the power of the fans. It seems like the relationship between the club and the fans here is unique. Yeah, it's absolutely unique. Absolutely unique. The, the club, uh, like a star, has this kind of uh, emotion between between supporters and between the club, something very different. It's not easy to explain because I'm personally thinking that our supporters, they are always, they don't like average matches, they don't like average people, they don't like average players, and they push the management of the club that we must be better. So for us, every day is indeed a new day. We must do something with all this. But they also have a reputation for being the most violent fans in Europe. I didn't think I'd get to see them in action when the Red Star game I had tickets for was snowed off. But it didn't matter. Red Star isn't just a football club. It has 27 different sports teams, and tonight there's a basketball game. Inside and out of the cold. It's against their arch rivals, Partizan Belgrade. In Serbia, even basketball games need hundreds of police in full riot gear. Nobody seemed at all interested in the game, and I can't remember who actually won. But the singing was loud, vicious and constant for over three uninterrupted hours. The Serbs claim to be the greatest hooligans in the world because they're more violent than the English and better choreographed than the Italians. A former leader of the Red Star fans, Zoran Timic, claims that what happens at these matches is far more sophisticated than it first appears. When the club was established after World War II, there was a communist regime in power in Yugoslavia. It was forbidden to show your true feelings in any circumstances. Somehow supporting Red Star meant you were showing resistance to the regime. It was the only way you could show it in those days. In May 1990, football, politics and violence all merged into one as the former Yugoslavia began to collapse. Red Star travelled to Croatia to play FC Zagreb. Croatia had just held its first multi-party elections in almost 50 years, and the parties favouring independence had won. Red Star and Zagreb fans fought pitched battles at one end of the stadium. At the other, the Croatian fans took on the police, symbols of the hated Yugoslavian state. Even the players got involved. The Zagreb captain, Zvonimir Boban, karate kicked a policeman he later claimed was attacking one of his own supporters. The violence that took place in Zagreb is now seen as one of the symbolic beginnings of the violence that was to come. The wars that soon followed presented armed robber Jelko Rajnatovic, better known as Arkan, with a perfect opportunity. With his own band of paramilitaries, Arkan ethnically cleansed his way around Croatia and Bosnia, gaining wealth and fame along the way. In 1993, he went into politics, starting the Serbian Unity Party. Why should I give a damn? I have one judge, God and the Serbian people. We didn't do not one uh, crime. So why should I give a damn? Before the war, Arkan had been strategically placed at Red Star as president of its fan club. He was in the perfect position to monitor the notoriously troublesome fans and to get some new recruits. Arkan named his paramilitary army the Tigers and many of them came straight from the terraces of Red Star. Although Arkan claimed that all they did was defend Serbia, the Tigers committed some of the worst atrocities of the whole conflict. In 1997, Arkan was indicted for war crimes. The Red Star supporters lost in the fighting are remembered on the walls of Belgrade. 
These are today's leaders of the Red Star fans. <laughs> So is it true that some of the, some of the toughest supporters yes, were selected and supposed to, yes. uh, many of them is, uh, was a leader, leader on, on our uh, side? And they had reputations here yes, yes. for being very yes, tough, very, very big so then yes. they were trained but, into soldiers? But they, they, uh, they were not uh, a criminal, criminals, they, they are uh, just a regular guy who like uh, our club. But they were well known for being good fighters? Yes. Yes. <laughs> and is it true that they took the toughest of the supporters and made them into soldiers? Uh, something like that, yes. But getting them to discuss the man who did the recruiting was difficult. They're all his friends. Not that he misused them and, and you know, used the violence. At that moment he came and he became the one. Right? It be but, but how do the Red Star fans remember him today? We respect him, he is dead, and that's, it's stupid to talk about that. Anna, they will take us to the newspaper, there, a Red Star newspaper, a Red Star Review, because uh, there is a lot of pictures. This is the north bank of Red Star Belgrade. It actually says heroes on the seats. Um, Arkan was the leader of the heroes, so we asked them about their relationship with Arkan and to begin with they defended him very strongly but at the same time the other guys were saying to our translator too many questions about Arkan, he's too interested in Arkan. I didn't get any further with my old friend Zoran Timic. But then we also read that Milosevic's man Arkan was made to be director of the fans at Red Star Belgrade. I don't want to talk to, uh, about Arkan. Oh really? Why, why, why can nobody talk about Arkan? I don't talk. Was it against the wish? The club didn't uh, want it? Because uh, I tell you on, on, only one thing. He was uh, my political... We were not political instruments. We were not or were we? No, we were I didn't support his political opinion. But uh, we were friends. Right. But when and I can't talk uh, nothing anymore. On January the 15th, 2000, Arkan was shot to death in a Belgrade hotel lobby. The rumour mill went wild. Either Arkan was murdered because he'd agreed to give evidence against Milosevic, or because his interests were clashing with those of other criminal gangs. But those who ordered the killings are still at large, and that probably explains everybody's silence. Although I couldn't feel much sympathy for Red Star's hooligans, there are those who have paid a heavy price for Serbia's aggression, even though they felt powerless to stop it at the time. The people was a victim. People pay such a high price for all these years. In dark, in the middle of the Europe, you can't travel. Your passport is not valid. What is going to happen? And now, do you feel like you can almost wipe the slate clean and, and start again and build again? Yes, yes. I think that in this, also this anniversary for us is important. 60th anniversary maybe is, is good, nice. Is that, is that a turning point for the club, do you think? What? That's a, for, that, that can be a, a moment when things change. Yeah, yeah, I hope. You. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. To, yes, honestly, we, I hope that will be a moment who will, be, who will remember that, like, uh, some kind of new beginning. When sanctions were imposed on Serbia in 1992, the effect on Red Star Belgrade was crippling. When the war ended, Zoran thought that football would be a way to rebuild bridges and show the world another side of Serbia. But instead, European clubs refused to play in Belgrade. If you are the away team, yeah. I, I wouldn't want to come and play in this stadium. Uh, no, why? You, you said, no matter who you're playing, if you're at home, you can win. But OK, you but he also is challenged. But this challenge for this club to try to come to win. This is all. I think this poor challenge for our players, if they have possibility to go to play on Wembley, is better than to go and play in Leskovac. Yeah, but in Wembley, the, 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 the crowd is 50-50. 
half and half. Here, the crowd will, will well, be intimidating. Never, though. Yeah, but it was it's selfish. This is selfish reason. Of course, but they want this to win. They unbelievable want to win. selfish reason. We had war. We had sanctions. We had everything. We had NATO bombing. And only what they had to do to, to take to show the hand. Okay, gentlemen, we are coming. We are coming to, to play because these people need to see somebody somebody would like to make friendship, not only to make, ah, you are not good boy, you are wild self, what is going to happen? But it was an excellent opportunity. So I came here expecting to hear about how Red Star Belgrade was Arkan's club. But actually, whenever you ask anybody about that, they're either very annoyed or very embarrassed. And it's clear they want to completely forget about that period of the club's history. Um, unfortunately for them, every day when they come to work, the first thing they see and the most dominant thing on the skyline is the house that Arkan built for himself. Even when you sit in the director's office, perfectly framed in his window, is this huge blue and white marble castle thing that Arkan lived in. My time in Belgrade had only reinforced how difficult it is for these countries to escape their violent past. As Sarajevo prepared for the World Cup qualifier, I wondered what good a football match could do. The day before the match, the Serb team arrive in town. The hotel they're spending the night in couldn't be more symbolic. Less than 10 years ago, the Holiday Inn had been at the center of the fight for Sarajevo. Now, the Serbian team are here as VIP guests. Their star and most capped player is Savo Milosevic, who once played for Aston Villa. Milosevic was actually born in Bosnia. I wanted to know why he chose to play for Serbia. Do you, do you describe yourself as a, as a Serb rather than Bosnian Serb? No, I'm a Bosnian Serb. Yeah, but it's just strange that one player would pick the Bosnian national team and one player would pick the well, Serbian national team. I'm older, and when I picked to play for a Serbian team, we were in the war. So back there, it was natural. But, but if, if, if two friends can play for opposing national teams, do you think that uh, says that... What can that... I tell you? I was born just on the, on the border, and I used to... I was crossing the border each day, and now I need a passport. <laughs> it's a lot of strange things happened here, and it's very difficult to explain and to accept for all of us. But it's, it's like that we, we have to accept. It. At the Bosnian training camp, the newly ethnically integrated team is on display. Their new coach is a Bosnian Croat, and he has picked Bosnian Serbs, Muslims and Croats to play for the national team. Some of the players still play professionally in Serbia. In the newly integrated team, the players were choosing their words carefully. So a lot of the players and fans have said that this game isn't about politics, it's not about revenge. Is that, is that possible? We don't have to mix sport and politics. We just want to achieve good results, and this game is the most important thing right now. One of the players came up to me before the training match and said, um, look, we have to be very careful what we say on TV because now they're, they're a fully integrated team. Um, he didn't say how we really feel is we're going to destroy those Serbian... Uh, but I got the point. Local journalists can afford to be a little less guarded. People with small children should not go there. A lot of police will be there. It will be hard to make some incidents, but I don't think both supporters would be full of love. <laughs> I don't think so. It's very hard to expect that. No, but supporters have said to us that they will not go there and start singing abusive songs or nationalistic songs. They will not go there looking for trouble, but if the other side start, then they will defend themselves. Yes, yes, it's it's easiest thing to say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if everything goes to form on Saturday, who should win? I think we'll win. We are... I think we are strong enough. <laughs> I knew from visiting Belgrade that few in Serbia had any plans to come to Sarajevo for the match. 
but there are more than a million and a half Serbs in Bosnia, and their view is very different. This is Natko, a 24-year-old waiter and leader of a small group of Bosnian Serb fans. They're going to the match on Saturday. I always felt like a Serb, and before the war I loved Yugoslavia. I like the colour of the Serb strip, and I like the national anthem, and I feel proud to be Serb and a Yugoslav. That's why I will support Serbia. We won't do anything to provoke Bosnian supporters. But if anyone provokes us, then we'll be ready. But could Serbs and Muslims live together again? No, we don't recognize Bosnia as a country. It's impossible because too much blood was spilled. Natko and his friends wanted to show me their local football club. At first, they seemed no different to any other young men I'd seen at football matches around the world. Before we even got to the stadium, the beer started talking and they turned on each other. But songs about Jayla, the Bosnian team that Alan supports, brought them all together again. Once we finally arrived at the stadium, Natko told me what he thought the Serbs had done wrong during the war. We lost the media war. The whole world ended up hating the Serbs. We were made to feel guilty, but we know it wasn't like that. Everyone made mistakes. It was just the Serbs who were portrayed as the big evil scum. But as ever in Bosnia, the very idea of pure ethnic division doesn't bear close scrutiny. Natko's own father is a Bosnian Muslim. But it's not, for many people, it's not so simple. Like, your father is Bosnian Muslim. I don't want to talk about this. My father is Muslim, but I feel Serb. That's the story. I don't want to talk about it. He, he, he wouldn't like to talk about this because he doesn't think it's important. Pushed further, Natko just got everybody to sing another song about JLo Football Club. <laughs> Hold on. I think I understood that. That said, that said that Slava are the champions and JLo are pussies. <laughs> the night before the match, and Sarajevo is quiet. At dinner with Alan, I asked him what kind of welcome the Serbs could expect. Um, and it's going to be roughly 33,000 Bosnians and maybe one or two Serbians. What will the atmosphere be like in the stadium? Believe me, I cannot explain. My, 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 my English is not so good to explain you the, 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 the hate 
the hate will be present and, and the, the, the violence will be present and uh, we shall see, we shall see. From both sides? From both sides, believe me, believe me. Almost every, every family lost someone during the war. We have 500 years of history around this football match. It's, it's, it's six or seven genocides in, in 150 years. Do you understand me? Match day. In Sarajevo city center, the atmosphere is turning ugly. And the Bosnians aren't waiting for the Serbs to start singing about the war. Unlike the Serbs, the Bosnians celebrate the breakup of Yugoslavia and their new independence. The most popular song is Fuck Yugoslavia, We're Better Off Without You. As well as the songs, the flags make it clear that this match is as much about religion and politics as it is about football. Across town, Natko and his friends were in typically boisterous mood. I wanted to see if he would meet up with Alan, his opposite number, to discuss the match. So his name is Alan, is it? Now we know who you are, Alan. Can I bring my knife, just in case? Maybe I'm skinny, but I'm a good fighter. Don't judge me because I'm skinny. <laughs> Bravado or real menace? With Natko, it was hard to tell. So um, if we believe both sets of fans, they're not going to start any trouble, they're just going to defend themselves. And they're not going to start singing any nationalist songs until the other side do. And we can all go home feeling very happy about how football unites former enemies. Um, what I bet in my life actually happens is that an hour before kickoff, they're both going to be singing songs celebrating famous massacres and uh, promising to do things to each other's mothers. <laughs> One of the 30,000 Bosnians arriving is Alan. The Serb fans are bussed into a separate entrance. Immediately, there's a confrontation with the police about what nationalistic symbols they're allowed to take into the stadium. Natko leads the Serbian fans towards the terraces. The Bosnians are waiting eagerly. They unfurl a banner with a message for the Serbs. We have 250,000 reasons to hate you. The first Serb fan enters the stadium. Soon the Serb fans unfurl their own banner, which the police have somehow missed. It says Serbian Sarajevo. The Bosnian fans are incensed. Some of them try to get close enough to tear the banner down. The Serb fans rush forward to defend it, 
and the riot police beat them back, to the delight of the Bosnian fans. So we've come to a fight, and we hope that in an hour's time a, a football match is going to break out. Matko then leads the Serbian fans in another song, which goes to the heart of the conflict. The atmosphere is chilling as the Serbian team come onto the pitch, followed by the Bosnians. In the midst of all this, it seems pointless to try to sing national anthems, although both sides dutifully try. As the Bosnian anthem begins, the Serbs turn their backs. <laughs> For the Bosnians, this represents a key moment in the celebration of their newly formed country. Pitch, the first threat comes from the Bosnians. In the training, they were great at three kicks. So if you had told me they would have had four free kicks in the first half, I'd have been sure they were at least one nil up. This is their fourth. Still at nil-nil, the Serbs go close. Natko responds by singing a song about an ancient battle. With minutes to go, Bosnia look like they deserve a penalty. The sense of injustice is familiar. The game ends in a nil-nil draw. Politically, it's perfect, and the players almost seem relieved. But for Bosnian fans, it's not enough, and they begin to attack Natko and the Serbs with stones. <laughs> the morning after the game, and there are no reports of major trouble. Most of the players have left the city to rejoin their clubs abroad, and I thought that after a goalless draw, Alan and Natko might agree to meet. So, what did you think of the game yesterday? 
They are one of the best teams in Europe and we are not, so I think the result was pretty much good for us. And there was no, well, very little trouble at the game. That was the best thing that could happen last night. Believe me, no troubles. That, that, that's a victory for us. They were singing some songs, those Serbs, and, and, and they didn't respond. And is that why you, won't, you don't want to meet Natko, the guy we've been interviewing from the Serbian side? Believe me, if you want to show that I can live with Serbs, I can live with Serbs, I live with Serbs, I have Serbs in my building, my mother is a half of Serb, I have friends who support Jelo, who support Bosnia, and they are Serb. But that guy, he's not Serb. It's, it's, it's the same thing like you wanna, you wanna put man with an animal. For me, he's not a man, he's not Serb, he's, he's, he's a zero for me. We were going to introduce you to the Bosnian fan who we've been filming interviews with as well, but he refused to do it because he said that you were singing songs about offensive songs. They were singing songs about hanging Serbs from trees and killing Serbs. I'd be the happiest man in the world if we only sang football songs, and that's what I promised. We only sang songs for Serbia. Then they started provoking us, and we retaliated. But he, he said they were singing, you were singing a few offensive songs, and so he thought that if you met, there was nothing to discuss at all, it would just end up in, in a fight. We could talk about it. If he thinks it'll end up in a fight, then so be it. I won't run away. OK, thank you again. Hvala. There are those, mostly too young to have fought in the war, who want the hatred to continue. But I'd also met Serbian victims of their country's actions who deserve a chance to move on. And although those who suffered during the war cherish their new independence, they still express nostalgia for the old way of life, where Muslims, Croats and Serbs had all lived, worked and played football together. Inspired by the best-selling books, BBC Two heads for Zambia to discover the real number one ladies' detective agency. Part of the Africa Live season, tomorrow evening at 7.